We are so happy to have you join us tonight. My name is Jerry Williams, and I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding. And we are happy to welcome Megan and Lauren, occupational therapists with extensive backgrounds, and some of you actually might know them, um, in occupational therapy with extensive background working with myositis patients. And uh, they join us tonight to talk about some different ways that as myositis patients, the holidays can be challenging, and uh, they're gonna start uh, with uh, some discussion and then feel free to ask your questions. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Megan and Lauren. So great to have you guys join us, thank you. Okay. Uh, great to have you join us. Oh, thank you so much for having us. We're really happy to be a part of this because in the myositis community, support is really important and nobody can offer the best support other than someone else who's living with similar symptoms as your own. So um, today, Lauren and I kind of wanted to talk and, and start a facilitated discussion about the holidays because they're coming. No matter <laughs> what we try to do, they are coming and they're coming fast. And the holidays, they can be pretty stressful. I mean, holidays, they can be joyful and cheerful and full of parties, but at the same time can be a time of self-evaluation, can be a time of loneliness, a time of reflection of what was in the past and fear of what's in the future. And so it can be a, a stressful time. And if you add on top of that, that myositis, it can lend itself to a whole another level of challenges but it's possible to get through the holiday season with joy and cheer. And so we're gonna talk about that today. So just some examples of how the holidays can be even more challenging if you have myositis, um, just managing your energy and dealing with fatigue, um, whether that's with all the holiday activities like shopping or having to cook or traveling, um, seeing a lot of family members, if it's going to someone's house where it's not necessarily ideally set up for you or accessible, you have to navigate those challenges. Um, you know, even just eating, if you have swallowing problems, enjoying the holiday meal can be, you know, more stressful if you're worried about your swallowing. And also having to talk to family members that you may have not seen for a while and having to explain myositis if they don't really understand what you're going through. So, you know, we are occupational therapists. Um, we're not the experts as much as you are, our patients, because you live with this every day and we learn things from our patients all the time. So we really want to hear, you know, from you, what are your challenges? What have you found out that's helpful to you? And, you know, we'll kind of chime in along the way when we have an idea, but we want to hear what are your concerns about the holidays and, you know, what have you come up with that makes it easier for you? Yeah, the whole point today is to leave with some ideas on how to make the holidays an even better experience. So I guess the first kind of a question, the main question we want to throw out to you guys to, to start a, a conversation is what are your biggest concerns with the upcoming holidays and how do you plan on tackling those concerns or challenges? Thank you so much for, for the introduction and for what you guys do. <clears throat> I'll, I'll start it off uh, because this just happened to me yesterday. My sister uh, moved to Georgia and uh, my family have, you know, the invisible illness part of things, even though I walk with a rollator and a cane and, you know, the canceling plans at the last minute. So anyway, so she asked if we wanted to have Christmas dinner together. Um, and she said, and you're not backing out this time. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, now do I, what do I say? You know, and of course, you know, I have a ton of experience with, talking about this disease and so forth, but my family just for some reason isn't so open to it. So, you know, I just said, you know, I can't control what my disease does. I said, but I will do my best, you know, to be there. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure if other people are experiencing those types of things. And, you know, another thing is when you get to like a holiday dinner, like you said, people haven't seen you in a while, aren't you better yet? You know, those yeah. types of questions are, are some of the things that <clears throat> I personally, deal with um, so you know trying to come trying to come up with a right answer um, and, and not get defensive is hard sometimes <laughs> because you know you, you know you're trying your hardest and you want to be there it's not like you're blowing off plans because you're lazy you're, you know you, you I want that social contact and to see my family 
So I think I know that we see that a lot in our support groups. <clears throat> so if anybody uh, wants to share on that topic, um, I think that's a, a great one. I saw that Linda had a, a question. My daughter and son-in-law are coming in Thanksgiving week. And I mean, I'm thrilled. We haven't seen them in a while. But um, my, I have an aunt that passed away a year ago. And so in the Jewish, it's a Jewish custom, a, a year after the death, you, it's called an unveiling. You unveil the grave. You, you go and see the tombstone. Um, um, it's like an honor thing. It sounds, I mean, obviously it's sad. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, so that is scheduled for Friday, the day after Thanksgiving. And I've pretty much made the decision that I'm not going to go to the unveiling because I know by the time, you know, with their visit and then Thanksgiving day being at the tape, you know, just everything. And, um, but it's just, it sucks. <laughs> just having to make that decision. I know my aunt would absolutely be like, you know, slap me upside the head for <laughs> thinking about jeopardizing my health or choosing the unveiling over spending time with my daughter, or, you know, whatever. But um, I think even as we learn, like Jerry, you said you have plenty of answers of what to say or, or and and even as we know logically what we should do or shouldn't do it just stinks <laughs> and then you add the medications on top of that so if you're on prednisone that can cause obviously some mood swings and can cause you know so your trigger might be a little short <clears throat> um so i always try to give myself a minute and sometimes my family will look at me like I'm crazy like why are you just standing there not saying anything but <laughs> I'm composing <laughs> myself to make sure that I don't offend anybody that I, I think it through um, and try to come from a place of better understanding of what maybe they don't see as to why they're coming up with uh, the questions and comments that they are Okay, it's a good example. And, you know, like, like Linda said, sometimes you have to choose, you know, the holidays, you might have invitations to, you know, various events and sometimes making that choice, you know, whose feelings are you going to hurt? Um, you know, is there anything that you guys, uh, Lauren and uh, Megan, that, I mean, I know this is out kind of outside of the occupational health side of things, but in your experience, just kind of talking with patients that you help. So First, um, was it, was it, Lin I think it was Linda who, who, I think she shared like a really good, um, experience because I think a, in, in other respects, people can relate to that. Like people have had different experiences like that. And the first thing I noticed is she was saying like, I know my aunt would say, you know, um, take your health first and, and, but it still stinks. And the reality is it does stink and it's, it's okay to be angry and it's okay to be sad. Those are emotions. It's how we, we cope with them. And so we could sit in the anger and the sadness and, and let that consume us, or we could do something. Um, one of the, um, the recommendations for just dealing with, with holiday stress, especially, as um, our, our bodies may not allow us to do the traditions we may once have been able to do, is to create a new tradition. And so in, in Linda's case, I know there's a, a very religious process of the unveiling, but at the same time, is there another personal like um, unveiling she could do to have that um, emotion that she wanted to experience with her family. And, and it's the same thing with the holidays. Um, you may get, you know, frustrated or angry because you're not able to do what you want to do, but maybe you could create a new tradition that you could do with your loved ones that is within your realm of comfort. And you know that you can do it with the symptoms that you have, whether it's fatigue or weakness or pain, and 
start to own that that new um, tradition. Yeah, one other thing that um, I think we've had a, one of our patients tell us is that sometimes if they're going to see family members they haven't seen in a while, they might, you know, write a letter that they can just give to the family member, like, this is what I want to explain to you about my disease. And Jerry, like you said, that kind of eliminates the you know, immediate reaction or getting upset or offended because you're kind of composing your thoughts ahead of time. You can put it all into words. You know, it's a little yeah. easier than maybe trying to explain it. You're not going to forget something and say, oh, I should have given this example or I should have said that. Um, so sometimes just even, you know, this is what I want to share with the family about my disease, you know, putting it into words, just maybe they'll have a better understanding too if they're actually seeing that you're taking the time to do that and you're trying to explain yourself. That's, that's a great tip. And we do have a, uh, an article on our website, How to Explain Myositis to Others, that offers some suggestions on how to start conversations. So I really like the letter idea. I, I think that's, that's wise. Like you said, <laughs> hold, back, hold back those initial uh, gut reactions, right? And Anne? Hey, guys. No, uh, well, no, not a question so much. I was just uh, agreeing with, with uh, Lauren's, their suggestion there. I mean, this is my first holiday season with this uh with my diagnosis because i was diagnosed in may so uh and my family is one for uh, you know lots of to do's and lots of get togethers and i uh, just got very particular about yes i'm going to this one no i'm not going to that one and i'm even thinking of jerry going back to what you said uh, you know creating the new tradition of making christmas just something that I I get away from actually because Christmas is so demanding it's so stressful um, that I'm thinking of my new tradition is I go to Manhattan every Christmas so you know uh -huh. <laughs> I go ahead and get the family used to that concept but I don't know Jerry I mean you're very you are such a generous soul because frankly for me and again only six months into this I'm done explaining my disease to people um, I've explained it to people that, uh, you know, are in my life, but I'm not going to keep explaining it to them. So I have to disagree with you a little bit there. I'm not going to keep explaining this disease to people because I got to get on with my life and me constantly going back and explaining it and redoing it is, is a tape I don't want to keep playing in my head. Yes. And for some people, you know, that's, that's obviously the right thing for them. Um, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and different, uh, ways and such and yes i tend to be more of the patient kind of yes, <laughs> you know, you are. okay let's try this again yeah i um, see pat has a comment she'd like to make pat yeah. relatively new to this whole thing <clears throat> excuse me i think what three months on three months since yeah. i was diagnosed i i think i've been dealing with it since the mid 90s and everybody always said oh go get your thyroid tested dear you'll be fine well my thyroid was fine um but I think the holidays, I have 12 grandchildren, and I've always made little hand-done ornaments for them. They may get them after Christmas this year. <laughs> We've done pieces of needlepoint or made quilts for them, something that they can carry around with them that says, hey, Grandma made this. I can't do it this year, and I'm having a little trouble with it. I, I can totally understand, Pat. I mean, that is, it's horrible that you have to deal with that. And I, I'm assuming you have inclusion body myositis? Yes. <clears throat> Please know that we're here for you. I, I know it's hard and some people don't understand how emotional that is. Lauren, um, Megan, mm -hmm. do you guys mm -hmm. have any, any suggestions that might be able to help with hand dexterity? And If I can use my hands, I'm okay. Um, I was injured in 80 something or another and dealt with chronic pain and finally went into a hospital up in Boston called Spalding Rehab Hospital. Um, and I will say, and mean sincerely, it was the worst, best 30 days of my life. <laughs> Unless you had a physical condition, for example, thyroid disease that you needed medication for, you didn't get medication. And they didn't care if you had to crawl on your hands and knees to get to whatever you were scheduled to go to. Okay. All of the things that I've dealt with so far, 
it's like, okay, it's there. Um, I've got to deal with it and I've got the tools. Well, to give my doctor's answers this time, I've had to let down all of those shields and I haven't been able to build them back up. You know, I obviously cry easily, which really annoys the heck out of me. Oh. And it's not that I'm not a crier, I am, but I would prefer to be more selective about it. <laughs> but it's, you know, where do I go? My kids are, I won't say they're not supportive, but they have come from an, a larger family that they really don't want to deal with the bad stuff or the uncomfortable stuff. So it's not that they don't care. They don't know how to deal with it. And, you know, they've always just thought I was lazy because I've been incapacitated for so long. Um, and I told them all and told them what the, the prognosis was. If I mean, I'm 77 years old. Who knows I've followed that long? But that it could be really debilitating. And they listened to me and they said they were sorry and they've not said another word about it since. Um, I will get better at dealing with this once I get through a plan. I'm scheduled to see my neurologist and she's going to transfer me, keep me as a patient, but transfer me to the Muscular Dystrophy Association because apparently with that evaluation comes an occupational therapist and a physical therapist so that I can put a plan in place and do some exercise, which I'm not doing now. Um, I think that there, there's a lot out of your control. And then I think that with myositis, a lot is out of our control. Even how people react or respond when we're trying to tell them about what we're going through. And we hear that a lot from our, from our patients is that they tell their family and they're not quite getting the response that they kind of hoped for. It can be really frustrating. So one, I really commend you for continuing to pursue a plan. I think getting a PT and OT evaluation is a fantastic thing. Maybe I'm biased. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the other thing that kind of jump started this was when you were talking about, um, what you would normally get for your grandchildren or you would make them. And one of the other recommendations we get for folks around the holidays is try not com to compare what you're doing now to past holidays. Because in the past, we might have had no trouble with uh, our finger dexterity or fatigue, but, but now we might. And so it kind of goes back to that, to that, um, recommendation earlier which is to try a new rec try a new tradition so maybe instead of making the needlepoint or the nice gifts you would give for your grandchildren but rather spending maybe an hour or two with them and let them try creating something christmas cookies or create a little placemat for their table something that down the line when they look back at memories they'll think about that funny time they were with grandma and they made a mess <laughs> or, tr or tried chasing the cat because I see you've got a cat. You know, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, that can be really meaningful. Um, it's an excellent yeah. At the same time, all those things that you made for them in the past, you know, they still have those. They can still treasure those going forward. It doesn't diminish anything that you've done in the past just because they're not going to get it every year in the future. You know, that even makes it more special that they have it. Yeah. And intellectually, I know all of this. It's emotionally that I absolutely, absolutely. And that, and it's a great point because there are a lot of times where we'll, we'll think of something and be like, okay, rationally, I understand that this is okay, but emotionally, I I just can't accept it right yet. Mm -hmm. And it's a process, and you, you you recognize that a little earlier when you said it will get better in time, and you know you'll you'll make some adjustments and. But with technology these days and the ability to do these video type sessions, you know, maybe that would be an idea that you could do with your grandkids because um, you can easily connect with uh, free tools like Skype um, and then you could maybe uh, tell them, how, you know, work together to create something that's not maybe as difficult um, and you could do it via video chat. Mm -hmm. Just an, another, you know, 
just kind of a, an idea off of the, the one that Lauren and Megan suggested. We did that early on um, in 01. We sold our house to our eldest son, sold everything we owned, bought an RV, and we traveled in the RV with three cats and three dogs for until the we got here. Jessica has had a question. Okay, thank you. It's not so much of a question. It was more, this is kind of an idea for Pat and her grandkids. Um, something that my grandmother um, used to do for me that I to this day remember is she would get us um, uncirculated like coins for the year we were born. And I still have every single coin she ever gave me. And so that might be something that you could do for your grandkids, like, you know, for this year is maybe get all of them, uh, you know, some coins uncirculated that were for the year that they were born because it's still special. It's still meaningful. Um, and maybe that might help. Just kind of came to mind when you were talking and maybe something to do to make you feel a little bit better. It's a good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Hopefully it helps. Thank you. It does. Thanks, Jessica. That was a great, uh, great idea. Great input. Hi, Rhonda. Hi there. How are you? Good. How about you? Fine. Well, I'm, I'm, I would like to start my New Year's resolution a little bit early after taking somewhat of a hiatus from exercising for a while. I'm going to be evaluated for physical therapy and want to know what is going to be helpful for, for me to communicate to the person who's going to be doing an evaluation and how to make sure I effectively tell them what they're dealing with in a myositis patient uh, because I'm different. <laughs> An inclusion body myositis to be specific. So um I would definitely bring them some information on inclusion body myositis because more likely than not, when you get to physical therapy, they are not going to know what inclusion body myositis is. And that's okay. Like we didn't learn about it in school. We learned about it once we started working. Um, and you want to find a physical therapist um, that you trust. So that you know when you say, I have this I have inclusion body myositis. Um, here's some information, but I would like you to do some of your own research. That you you have a PT that will go go that extra mile and do a little research on their own. And I would come with resources, so you can send them to the Understanding Myositis group. You can send them to um, the Myositis Association website, so they get a, a background knowledge of what's going on. The most important thing I think you'll want to tell them also is um, that it's a, a a chronic progressive disease. So insurance companies love to see progress and then they love to cut you off as soon as you can't prove progress. Um, with inclusion body myositis, our approach is a lot more let's um, maintain and optimize what you have and um, talk about strategies to compensate for independence when that weakness is getting in your way. So that's that's kind of the biggest thing you need to know um, as a therapist when working with them. Um, one thing I would just add is that a lot of the therapists might, you know, evaluate you, test your strength, and then they would kind of focus on the muscles that are more weak. But our approach that we do with our patients and our physical therapists that we work with, you know, we want you to kind of exercise your whole body. So even the muscles that are still pretty strong, we want you to keep them strong so they can help you compensate. So we don't only want to focus on, you know, the quad weakness or the finger weakness. Um, we want to kind of do a good comprehensive exercise program so that you can maintain your strength as much as possible. And I would also tell them that um, low intensity exercise is what we recommend for IBM. So it's more high repetition, lower weight, lower intensity exercise. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I guess my main concern is that they will want to, I mean, everyone wants to see progress. and they won't be able to fix me and I know they would like to be able to fix me. Uh, I certainly would like that too. We all would. Like that. But, uh, okay. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm communicating effectively with them so that I can, you know, do what I can do. 
Yeah, and I would I would let them know that you want a nice strong home exercise program because um, Like I said insurance companies are going to probably be hounding notes to make sure that um, What the physical therapist is doing is skilled and needed and so you want to make sure you're prepared whenever that PT says Okay, you're no longer have any visits that you are leaving with a strong, solid home exercise program that you can do at home safely. Uh -huh. And I would also, you know, there's other things that PT can look into. They can look into some bracing. If you need bracing, they can work on balance um, and any equipment to help you with balance. So I'm not saying that they can't create goals that you can't achieve. Like they can put some, we put goals down for our patients that we work on achieving, but um, I would really want to make sure they got you that good home exercise program. And if where you're going, if they do have occupational therapy available, it would probably be helpful to get an evaluation with them as well, especially um, because IBM affects you know, the hands and the upper body, which you can kind of um, you know, hone in a little bit more on that with OT. And that way you could also you know, be able to get more therapy services potentially. It's a great question, Rhonda, and, and you guys bring up a great point about you know, the insurance company wanting to see that progress. And I've had that conversation with my physical therapist that I had in home. Pat, did you have something to add? Um, yeah, one of the things that I started doing a, probably a couple of years ago is I keep a journal. And when I, when I think of a question, I've got sections in the journal where it goes to this doctor or that doctor. And I write down what my question is so that it's there when I go see them and I make sure I bring the journal with me so that I know what, I, you know, what I'm looking to find. And uh, they find that helpful as, as do I. And I'd actually like to go back to the very beginning of um, her comment, which is I want to start New Year's off, right? New Year's resolutions. This can be a fresh slate, a fresh perspective on the upcoming year. I highly encourage everyone to think of a nice, realistic, um, achievable resolution. It can be a, a really great starter where you can have a little bit more control over the direction you're going starting the new year. So I commend you guys for thinking of exercise as yeah, a new year's resolution. Right? <laughs> of course, we'd love to hear that. We've been doing a lot with exercise this year uh, as the research has kind of you know, come out more because, you know, when I was diagnosed, we were told don't exercise. This was many years ago. Um, you know, so it's some of us that are still in that era, you know, we're still kind of trying to grasp around it. So we've been bringing a lot of uh, people on to talk about exercise as treatment rather than as just something that, yeah, you know, you need to do. It's actually part of the treatment plan. Um, so, <clears throat> So I'm glad that, it's, that the education is, is working and sticking and people are thinking about it. I have a question. Actually, great minds. Linda and I thought about the same thing at almost the same time. So our question is about uh, any ideas for holiday food prep, preparation or modifications, and what kind of foods we should stay away from, like a lot of sugar, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, I actually want to hear, um, before we voice our therapist opinion. Um, what other people think about that question? Um, does anyone else have any meal prep ideas? Because um, that's a huge part of the holidays, food. Only food prep idea we have is do less. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And plan early. I actually have a suggestion. Hey, Angela. Uh, to sit the whole time you're doing it. So don't stand up and uh, prep the food. Just sit as much as you can and prep because if you're on your feet for too long, then it's, it's just going to tire you. And so do that. <laughs> That's what I do. That's a good suggestion. We suggest that to all our patients. In fact, for all activities, like if you're folding laundry, sit while doing that. If you're washing dishes, if you've got a bar stool, sit or drying dishes. So. I like that idea a lot. Yeah, if you can save your energy, you know, you're going to need it for later, so. Great tips. Anybody else have uh, some tips or questions about food preparation? I was going to say one of the things that we do, because uh, mashed potatoes is like a Thanksgiving must, right, um, is we will, um, like, peel them one day, 
and chop them and then like put them in the pot of water and leave it, you know, and then you cook it the next day so that that way it's not all one sitting. Um, so a lot of times you can do a lot of like pre prep, you know, cut up the, and if you don't want to leave it in the water or whatever, you could cut the potatoes, peel them and cut them and put them in a bag. And then the next day you pull them out and put them in your water and boil just like little things like that. Anything that you can kind of prep over days, um, spread it out instead of trying to do every single step in one. And then the other thing is in my family, um, at all possible, we kind of do like more of a potluck kind of thing where other people are responsible for um, dishes. And so maybe, you know, talking about starting new holiday traditions, maybe if you are a person that used to do it all, maybe it's, you have to kind of relinquish that control and ask other people to do some of the dishes and maybe that'll help. Those are great suggestions. I like the idea of a tradition and then you get to try, you know, different dishes that different people are preparing and could, you know, be even better. Uh, but I definitely like the idea of preparing things ahead of time if you can and breaking it up into more manageable chunks. Mm -hmm. And also do smart grocery shopping. Um, so for me personally, I love spaghetti squash, right? But cutting a squash, like a, a giant butternut squash, is the bane of my existence. I absolutely hate it. In fact, that's the reason why I don't eat it much. But in my local grocery store, they actually now sell pre-cut squash. And so that's one step I eliminated from an activity that usually requires so much energy. So you can find pre-cut vegetables and fruits in your grocery store if, if you shop. One of the things that um, Walmart here and Sam's Club do and some of the other stores is you can put your order in by email and they tell you what time to go pick it up and they bring it out, they check it off and they put it in the car for you and all you've got to do is drive there and drive home again and uh, my partner in crime here takes it all. <laughs> yes, that's like it's a big, big, yeah, it's yeah. a big like move that grocery stores are doing all over. Um, I know just our local grocery stores here are doing it. Um, Amazon is yeah. involved. Even in delivery right to your house, some of them too, like mm -hmm. Peapod or Amazon. So there's a lot of options which cut out the shopping and the walking around the store and the picking everything out. You know, you can sit down at your computer and select everything that you want and it's right there for you. So it much easier. Save money so you don't impulse buy when you're in the store. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. we have to have some restraint. <laughs> so, ladies, I have a question. Um, obviously, as you say, the holidays are stressful. How do you, um, in a in a situation that begins to become stressful, and you can tell when you're beginning to be under stress, how do you talk yourself off of that ledge? Deep breath, step back. You know, I mean, the, the, the situation is different from ever, for everybody. But I know when I'm beginning to get stressed, I'm very mindful of it. And I know that I have to take a deep breath and think about, is this actually even worth being stressed about? But are there, what are those types of coping mechanisms that we're all going to come up against, I think, in the, in the holidays? Yeah, so stress management is different for everybody, so I'll just throw that out here. But this is what's the same for everybody, mm -hmm. is that there's a stress response in our body. So our heart rate naturally increases. Our breathing rate will naturally become more shallow which is decreasing the amount of oxygen to the brain and releasing dopamine. So that's just science. It happens to everybody. The best thing you could do is, one, become more mindful or aware of your body. So body awareness is incredibly important. And for those with myositis, the body awareness is probably even more heightened because you're aware, um, you know, even of how your muscle is feeling while you're brushing your teeth. I mean, it comes, things start to really break down. But if you can catch yourself before the stress mounts too high, if you can catch yourself when you feel your heart starting to race, you can enter a coping skill. One of the most widely used coping skills is a deep breath. 
And it actually has physiological changes in the body. When you take a breath, your heart rate will lower and your lungs will expand. You will get more oxygen into the brain, reducing the amount of dopamine in your brain. And so a deep breath will naturally help you think clearer. You're getting more oxygen to your brain. Um, however, a deep breath isn't to just huff and puff because then you're probably at that point like actually raising your heart rate and, um, and, and not helping much. But the deep breath is probably uh, the most basic and universally accepted coping skill to, to help break down that physiological change. But in, in my experience, the best defense is the good offense. <laughs> you want to, to set yourself up for success, okay? So that means recognizing when uh, you're going to be in the most stressful, stressful moments. Like, for example, if you're having a lot of family over, you might think, okay, um, I know when Uncle Bobby comes, he's going to say something and it's going to raise my stress level. So if you can already identify your triggers and create a plan for yourself in that moment, whether it's, okay, I feel my heart racing, I'm going to take my deep breath, then I'm going to step over to the side and I'm going to like, um, I don't know, need some dough bread, you know, like bread dough. Or if you're not in the kitchen and, and you, you feel like, okay, I feel my heart raise, I'm going to take my deep breath, and then I'm going to step in to the next room, and I'm going to pick up my, my knitting needles, or I'm going to turn on the radio, um, and I'm going to calm myself down. So after the deep breath, the coping skill is based off of whatever you, know, you find most relaxing. So for example, mine is crocheting. Um, if I'm stressed, I take a deep breath, I sit in my lounge chair and I crochet. That's not going to work for everybody, especially if you've got um, hand dexterity, weakness, or fine motor skills. That could be actually more stressful. So you have to figure out what is going to be the calming factor for you. Right, if it's like some kind of music that you like, you know, you're going to put on a song that is calming to you. Or if it's um, a smell, some people find like lavender or different aromas to be more calming. Um, if it's going to be just you know, getting a little bit of movement and, or just stepping away from a situation. So I really like the idea of, you know, having a plan in place for your stressful situations and then knowing, you know, what's going to work for you and what you're going to try to implement. Usually what happens when problems arise, it's when we don't notice our heart rate raising, we don't notice our shallow breathing, all of a sudden there's like this emotional storm in our brain and we're not seeing clearly and then things really break down. So the biggest thing you can do is just be aware of your own body. Things like um, mindfulness, um, meditations, and body scanning, it's a really big up and coming practice um, that I personally find so, uh, like, so valuable. Um, I really would recommend for everyone to get a to, to check some of that stuff out. It really helps with eliminating some of the minor stress responses throughout the day because you can catch yourself before it gets bad. Yeah, and you can go on YouTube and find a ton of just five-minute videos of a body scan or a meditation, which is just five minutes. You just listen to it, and it really does, it does help. It does work. And there's tons of stuff out there and you can find as resources for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Linda? Um, just two really quick suggestions Suggestion. along with what you were saying. Um, one is if you have a Fitbit, um, I know mine has, when I click through, there's um, a relax option and it, I think it's two minutes that it, um, I forget, I did it on the plane home from Minneapolis. I had started, like, we, we had turbulence and, and I was like, okay, so <laughs> I, I did it and it, and it, you know, it worked. I just focused on it. Um, but also, um, calm app, if anybody's heard of that or their website, but a lot of their stuff you have to pay for, but they have a breathe bubble and it's just a very soothe. I think you can choose different options, but it's the bubble just, you know, it goes out and it goes down to get you to just slow your breathing. I think it's, you know, you could do it for, 
15 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it is. And, and if it's something you, you know, if you have your phone under the table or something mm -hmm. to just look at it, you know, nobody has to know that, you know, cousin Johnny just pissed you off. And you're <laughs> <laughs> so just, I just wanted to throw those out there. That's a, it's great tips. Um, and I know for me, one of the ways that I easily get stressed is through uh, trying to rush. And I need to slow down. Um, and, you know, I start dropping things and then it makes me even more angry and stressed because then it's like, oh, now I got to pick this up. And that's just taking another, you know, bit of my time and energy and so slowing down for me is something that I try, I try to be aware of. It's like, okay. And I think Lynn made a good point also is what you're stressing about. Is it even worth you know, thinking through that? Is it even worth my health and my energy to be stressing about it? And mm -hmm. I guess that kind of brings in the mindfulness aspect, being mindful of, like you said, uh, Lauren and Megan, of your body and knowing the signs. And, and I will add that, trying to avoid toxic people in your life whenever you can has excellent benefits. I know it can be very hard. Um, I've had to remove some people from my life that were just constant negative and just stressed me out. No matter if I was talking to them on the phone or a text message or whatever the case is. And so, you know, that's, some of these hard decisions when you're living with myositis and, you know, other chronic rare debilitating diseases, you know, you just sometimes have to make those tough decisions. And, you know, there's not sometimes a lot of help that anybody can provide you with doing that. It's, you know, we're here to help support you through that for sure. I, uh, I was thinking back to this stressful, um, like, how to manage stress and Jerry you talk about like rushing and then you get mad when you drop things I don't know if anyone out there is a perfectionist I know I am and that leads to a lot of stress when you hold yourself or a situation to a really high standard if you have preconceived um, assumptions of how something's gonna go and you feel like it's not going that way you can get really stressful so right here on my recommended list, I wrote forget perfection because we are mere humans on this earth just trying to get through. So I, um, I sometimes will like repeat like really positive quotes in my head. I do it a lot during the day when things start going awry. Um, you know, I, I, for example, I, I tell myself, like in my head, I'll say this too shall pass when like something's getting very, like it's getting worked up and I have to remind myself, okay, this is a temporary frustration. Or the one I use so much is smooth seas don't make skilled sailors. Um, when I feel like things are out of my control and I feel like things are working against me, um, I'll remind myself if everything was going great, I would be boring. It's challenging. That's going to make <laughs> me even better. So. Finding that little quote that you can just like repeat in your head like a mantra um, can help you get through a situation where you might not be able to like escape. Like Uncle Bobby's got you cornered. Um, one other thing that I think is just important to remember kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning is, you know, you're dealing with family members, you're dealing with a lot of people that you care about and you love and that are a part of your life. But you can't put pressure on yourself to try to accommodate everyone else during the holidays. You really have to you know, prioritize and do what's going to be best for you. If you're going to disappoint some people or they're not going to understand, that's really on them. That's not on you. If they're not understanding that you have to choose to skip something because of your disease and it's going to, you know, not exhaust you for the rest of the week. If you're choosing to skip one thing so you can feel better the next day and do something you need to do. I mean, you have to be okay to be a little bit selfish and say, what do I need to do to get through the holidays? And, you know, my family has to be okay with it. If they're not, then that's on them, yeah. not you. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. And, it, and it's hard to accept that, you know, sometimes when, you know, for the emotional people like myself, you know, because I always want everybody to be happy and fine. I, 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 I'm a fixer. I want to be able to fix things and make things okay for people. And, you know, that obviously sometimes stresses me because, 
sometimes things just can't be fixed. Sometimes people mm -hmm. just need a, an ear that just wants you to listen. They don't want anything back. They just want to vent. And, you know, so, you know, I think as, as social media and everything kind of, I think we've gotten bad at communicating. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, you know, sometimes we don't communicate enough um, asking people what they want, you know, because it seems, it almost seems rude. In, in my head, you know, I'm here for you. What, what do you, what would you like me to do? Or you know, something, you know, that sounds nicer than what do you want, obviously. But, you mm -hmm. know, because um, sometimes they don't want anything. Sometimes, you know, they want, you know, I just want your opinion. Um, so. Right. And otherwise, you know, if you're not asking, then you're just making assumptions. They're making assumptions and yeah. they could both be totally wrong. So I think exactly. you're yeah. just asking in a nice, clear way it can solve a lot of that. Yes. You know, assuming problems. I think a lot of things come down to lack of effective communication skills and that we're afraid to ask <laughs> people what it is that, or tell people what I want, you know, this is what I'm looking for. Cause in some people's head, that's selfish. And, you know, sometimes you need to get a little bit selfish. Yeah. Because it's selfless in the end, because yeah. if we don't get selfish, we get worn down. Yes. We're no good. For ourselves or for else. others. Yeah. Absolutely. I, think I, saw, I saw a question um, pop up on the screen that someone had typed that was about like navigating other people's houses, which I think was a really good question. By NK, um, tips for getting around others' houses during the holiday events. Um, maybe we'll actually kind of put this out first to anybody else too if you have any ideas and then we can say what we think. But you guys had some great ideas for the meal prep. So if you have any ideas for this problem. I think with being in other people's houses, um, to me, one, or at least for me, one of the biggest things is asking for help. If, you know, if it's harder to get around in, in somebody else's house or they have more steps than you're used to or able to do or um, um, even, you know, if it's maybe communicate with, the person you know where you're going if, if you know there are obstacles ahead of time and or um, you know communication but but asking for help if you, if you need help maneuvering and because I'm I'm terrible terrible about that I'll, I'll try things and and then of course then that'll play into exhaustion and stress and um, so just that just popped in my head about just you know be vocal if if you need help Mm -hmm. so if you know there's potential obstacles that might be in the way if you've never been to their house before maybe asking you know how many steps do you have to get in yeah. not trying to be a nag or you know but this is these are my limitations and I just want to be sure things can go smoothly that's a mm -hmm. good idea yeah ahead of time mm -hmm. and I know like you know I would worry that you know I don't want I don't want them to think I'm, I'm asking them to move furniture or anything like that and you know just just to carefully ahead of time say or ask ask those questions mm -hmm. and most likely you know the people probably wouldn't mind moving the furniture just to have you there so it's you know it comes down to that communication again um who else has something to add oh this what, is Rhonda. i was going to say one thing i do when i go to someone's house right away is I check out the bathroom, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, whether or not I will be able to get on and off it safely. And if not, if I need to ask someone to stand outside the door or come in with me, uh, I just get over it or else sometimes I take a, a portable riser with me. Uh, <laughs> whatever works, but it's like, I don't want to spend, you know, eight hours at somebody's house for the holidays and not be able to have a sip of water. I mean, let alone, <laughs> a, glass, let alone a glass of wine. So, you know, uh. Yeah, the bathroom is definitely a huge area. Like, I'm glad you brought that up. So like you said, with um, bringing your own toilet riser 
or we recommend to a lot of our female patients, um, you know, the female urinal, either the Go Girl or there's a couple of different brands. But um, if you haven't seen or heard of that, you know, a lot of our patients find it very helpful because they can, you know, use the bathroom without having to sit down. Um, not to go into too much detail, but if you have any more questions on that, you know, helpful to a lot of our patients. And um, also what Linda, what you said about just asking the person, you know, who's hosting, they may not even kind of be thinking that you would have any challenges because for them, the stairs in the bathroom are no problem. So they may not even be thinking if it's an issue. But as soon as you bring it up, they may be, you know, very happy to accommodate you or help in any way that they can. And then you don't have to feel uncomfortable bringing it up when you get there or having it cause a stress response because you're there and everyone's around and everyone's trying to get food and, you know, you haven't addressed these issues with the stairs or the bathroom or anything like that. Yeah. I guess the, the biggest questions I would ask or I would recommend to ask would be, are there stairs to get in? If there's stairs, are, is there a railing? I would ask about where the bathrooms are located. Is there a bathroom on the main level you will be in? Um, and I would ask about the seating options. Are there chairs with armrests on them? Um, or do you have um, other you know, seating options other than a low couch? Those, I think, are the biggest things you may want to ask. And if there's any, you know, difficulty with eating or cutting foods, you might ask, you know, like, what, are, what is there going to be to eat to see if there's finger food options or, or something other than, like, a tough steak you have to cut through. And I, I think that also um, brings into, you know, making room uh, for a wheelchair. You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for me personally, I don't want to get there when I'm in a wheelchair and then somebody say, you know, out loud in front of everybody, oh, well, how, where, where are we going to put him? You know, something like that. So I, okay. I, I try when I go in, you know, if I'm in a wheelchair, depending on um, my flares and such, I'll just go to the host and I'll be like, is it possible just to remove one of the chairs from the table so that I can just slide in, you know? Mm -hmm. And that might not be the best way to do it, but it, it usually works. Um, but I know with especially a lot of our IBM patients, um, you know, they have, some of the bigger, bulkier power chairs. Um, so ensuring that there's room um, for those types of devices. and Right, and like just goes back to communicating and planning ahead, because if whoever is hosting is aware of that, you know, they're gonna be able to help you make accommodations ahead of time instead of someone having to awkwardly bring up, oh, where are we gonna put this person? And then, you know, you feel like uncomfortable when it could have been easily, you know, just planned ahead. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is coming down to the fact that I think a lot of us as patients, <laughs> we just have to start getting a little more comfortable communicating our needs. And it's hard for me. I, I'll tell you, that's one of the hardest things for me. So I, I can imagine it is for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think it's a myositis issue that sure. we have trouble communicating. Yeah. I think it's a human issue. We, um, as I think humans, just don't like to be vulnerable and don't like to ask for help or show our weaknesses or insecurities. And I don't. I think that um, by by communicating and showing some vulnerability and insecurities, I think people actually respond better because then they feel more comfortable sharing some of their own. Mm -hmm. uh, vulnerabilities and insecurities so it's it's it can be a, a certainly a tough thing but it can be one of those things that once you get the ball rolling um, the relationships you can build with people are much deeper and meaningful you know the question about asking the host uh, as a host when people have particular needs I'm absolutely delighted to hear about it because right. I can make the experience better for them. Uh, and I think a lot of hosts might feel that way. Not all, certainly. But uh, it's nice to hear from people who have needs and express them. So feel good about asking. Right, that's a great point. I think a lot of people, you know, like you said, not everyone, but a lot of people are happy to accommodate and happy to know that their guests are happy and they're okay and they're enjoying themselves and they don't have to worry about it. Preeti and Wes are both interested in talking about um, support braces, uh, some things that might help with walking. Well, I, um, yeah, hey, I uh, tried to, I think I sent a link to a particular brand because I've been kind of researching it for the past two weeks. I posted questions on Facebook 
but there's one particular brand called um, Inspired Uplift, which has power knee stabilizers. And I sent a link out to everyone on the group chat. And that's the brand that looks kind of promising to me, but I'm, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of them or tried them. Uh, I'm sort of curious because I am, I am mobile and I don't, I have some falls. Um, I'm having a harder time climbing steps. So I'm wondering if that might be a potential um, help to me, a support. But I would just like to know if anyone has heard of that particular brand because when I've asked on the groups, they have used other types and most people don't seem to like them. And also I wondered if the OTs had any, uh, had seen any, um, you know, had seen that particular one or have heard of anyone or helped people, you know, with knee braces, so just putting it out there. Great question, thank you. <clears throat> Do you are you guys aware of this brand at all? <clears throat> I know you uh, can't. Uh, yeah, not that particular brand. Um, I think in general, our patients with braces have some mixed results, and I think that's also you know, there's not a lot of research supporting it. Not that there's a lot of research in my side, it's in general, but. Um, I think it can work for some people, not work for other people. Um, we were kind of talking a little bit earlier that our physical therapists where we work are the ones who do more of the um, brace, you know, kind of evaluation with certain patients. So we're thinking of hopefully, you know, turning this into like a series of um, kind of webinar discussions and we would like to, you know, bring them in, in the, for a future one possibly and they'd be able to speak a little bit more to the braces, but in terms of like that specific brand or specific braces, I, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar. So okay, what I know you. from from my experience with working with folks with braces, um, I guess probably the most common brace people use is like a ground reaction AFO, which is a specific type of ankle foot orthotic that helps with, um, as you take a step, pushing your knee into extension so it doesn't buckle. Um, as far as like the bigger braces, now I don't know, I haven't seen a picture of the brace you sent, um, but as far as like the bigger braces, the biggest complaint I get for folks is they say just to put it on is exhausting um, and that their hand strength, like it can be very difficult to put on and put off and so it ends up just kind of sitting in a corner and then not using it. So my biggest recommendation if you are considering an AFO is to get, definitely go through a physical therapist um, so that they can evaluate not only what brace would be best for you but what brace is going to work for your life so that you can get it on and off comfortably and you'll actually use it. Um, some of those nice Bionic looking braces look amazing, but they're bulky. They're uncomfortable. They they might even hurt a little bit. You can't get them on and off. So um, it's kind of got to be like a balancing act. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, Brady. Appreciate that, and thanks for your feedback. Sure. And and yes, I don't I don't think I mentioned at the start of this that um, that this is uh, going to be a series of webinars. Um, so. You know, if you have specific topics, uh, please feel free to email them to us. We'll share them and discuss them for upcoming sessions. Um, but um, we have one more question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jason. You know, you were, you were talking about going other places and what to do. Me, I don't think I'm going to have a problem with Chris. Anyway, I spent 11 days in the hospital. Now I'm in a skilled nursing facility. They're saying the doctors originally said 17 days. Everybody here is saying a lot more. I mean, they're talking four to six weeks. What about in this situation? Because, I mean, with me, there's a lot of stress. And truthfully, I mean, rather than the staff, I think I'm the youngest person here. But I think for me, I mean, most of it is done at my house. How do you handle something like this? Yes, they said I could go home. Luckily, where I'm at, I'm four blocks from my house. But with what's going on, I can barely walk. I mean, I've got my wheelchair. But So to shorten it up, what do you do if you're in the hospital or in a nursing facility for the holidays? I mean, that right there for me, I, they said I can go home. But it's still, you have that in the back of your mind that you might not. 
they said you can go home as in be discharged or you can go home just for like a day just for the holiday and luckily i'm four blocks from my house so it kind of makes things a little bit easier and then do you have any um like a ramp to enter your house or is it accessible yeah. via wheelchair no, I, got, I got a ramp yeah okay okay it's still so, I mean, stressful oh absolutely i think just kind of like as much as we've been talking about like planning ahead as much as you can like making mm -hmm. sure you're kind of making sure all the staff is on the same page um, because I know, you know, in skilled nursing facilities, any kind of facility, you know, when one person tells you one thing and then the next person comes on the shift and they're completely unaware. So even kind of talking to the higher up management type people and saying, okay, this is my plan to go for the holiday. This is what we're going to do. And like, you know, you're really advocating for yourself and being in charge of the plan and making sure that everybody who needs to be aware and participate in it is, is aware. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, I've been planning ahead for this. Uh, you know, I've never had to deal with being out of the house for a holiday like this. I will, you know, I will admit a lot that's helping is sessions like this and the community in general. You still have that in the back of your mind on, you know, what are you going to do? Because with me, I'm thinking, well, it's more stress on the family. It's, you know, they have to come get me, they have to bring me back, and I, I wouldn't be able to help like I do every single year. I would say try to go home, though. Like, you know, like they said, talk about, you know, talk about your plans and just, you know, I'm sure your family wants you to be there regardless of what you're able to do or not. Jason, challenge those, some of those thoughts, like, um, so if you have a thought that this is adding so much stress to my family and I'm a burden, think about, well, what fact do I have in that assumption? Have they told me that I'm a burden to them and that they don't want me there? Or did they just agree to pick me up and drop me off? If they've agreed to pick me up and drop me off. That's probably because they want you there. So our brains work in mysterious ways and oftentimes we create these assumptions but in the holidays, it's really a good time to start challenging them because family wants to be together. I mean, um, especially if they're, if they're working on those plans with you. I think you would only add to the experience in a positive way. And especially because, you know, you're in the skilled nursing facility. You're not, the holiday is one day, but there's a whole holiday season and being around and all those experiences, they're probably, you know, they're not having you there for that. So they probably really want you there, especially for the day, anytime they can get with you. Um, you know, I know being in a skilled nursing facility is hard for anyone at any time and especially being a younger person So but especially around the holidays So I think anything that You can find throughout your day that you can do to enjoy and just take some time for yourself and you know, Therapy is one thing. It's important but I just try to find things that you can do as well to get through the day in there And keep in touch with the support um you know, if you've got a, a handful of people that you can reach out to daily to help you get through these hard times, use them. He does. Luck, luckily for me, the family in question is the family I live with. It's a little bit off topic, but I think it's important. And we discovered that the community housing organization mm. had a grant for seniors and disability. It is income-based. Um, but they want to keep seniors or people with disabilities in their homes. They came in, and part of the grant is that anything they find that isn't currently up to today's code, they have to make today's code. So they came in and basically cut, gutted our 1935 house. They mm -hmm. enlarged all of the doorways so that, the hand, that a um, wheelchair could get through. They put a concrete ramp on the back of our house. They did a num They brought our electrics. Our all all of the house systems were <clears throat> made new. It's something that we would never have been able to afford to do. Yeah. And I don't know if other communities do this. Um, what they do is they spend a certain amount of money. You have to pay back a portion of it that is interest free over twenty years. There are grants uh, at the state level, community level, um, so be sure that you check those out. I actually do that. And uh, 
did you, uh, Lauren or Megan, have anything? I was just saying, I feel like even us, we don't know a lot of things that are available, but like that's such a great example that there are things in communities that I think maybe they don't advertise a lot because so many yeah. people would take advantage of it. But if you find out about it, you know, either by just researching or word of mouth, it, it can do great things like what they did for Pat. Yes. We, uh, we have run out of time. Thanks so much for joining us. So thanks, everybody. Thank uh, Lauren and Megan for joining us this evening. And thank you for all your tips. And we look forward to the next session. And uh, we just like to thank Jerry and Lynn for organizing all of this and, you know, allowing us to be involved. We really enjoyed this and meeting all of you. And um, please feel free to just send us any suggestions for any future sessions. You know, we'd like to continue doing more of these, but we'd want to hear what you want to talk about. Perfect. We appreciate your time. And, you know, it's our pleasure. We're happy to have you guys. So we Thank appreciate you. it. And thanks everybody that attended and participated. Everybody have a wonderful evening and enjoy the holidays. Thanks, thanks. everybody. Thank you.